message, I struggled to find a good theme. As I pondered this, I think I found one, a good example. I want to focus on the compassion of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm thinking of this like a string of pearls on a woman's neck. Each pearl is pretty on its own. But that beauty is amplified when you put together in a, set, in a string with other pearls. Our Lord has many attributes, to, and taken together, the whole is greater than the sum of the pieces. And you'll notice that I'm going to focus on compassion, the compassion of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, what we have is a series of examples, and the introduction here is why is compassion so important? Think about that. Jesus himself told us that we were to be light in a dark world and that we need to help bring people into the light that we may help them understand the gospel of Christ. Doing so brings salt and light into a sun-filled world. How else will we win people to Christ? I do want to mention one example. I have a neighbor who is a retired optometrist. A few weeks ago, I had cleared my dr driveway from the last slush storm, and I noticed that my neighbor had his snowblower out. And the snow was so, was so uh, wet and heavy that the snowblower couldn't uh, keep up with it. You know, he would try to get it to run, and you just see this little coming out of the, out of the snowblower. Uh, those of you who have been there know it's not a fun point to be. And yet, this was my neighbor. And so I went out, and I worked with him with, with my snow shovel, and we cleaned his driveway, and we had a really nice talk. And as I thought about that, Jesus did tell us that he wants us to love our neighbor. So this is going to be a busy slide. So just take your time and read the examples. I'm going to leave this up for a bit. These are the examples that I will use to describe our Lord's compassion to all that he came to serve. I'll give you a couple of minutes to read through that. It is busy. And those are the, are the uh, pearls that we're going to look at. And, you know, I'll steal from the LDS for this one time that uh, uh, the pearls are very pretty. Uh, anyway, uh, these are the uh, the examples that we're going to see. And we're going to see that Jesus uses his own timing, and he really works everything together. And as I worked on this, I was just amazed at uh, how he uh, dealt with people. So first, we're going to start with the parable of the sower. And one of the things we realize is that Jesus often used parables as a teaching tool. And you'll note that his audience did not understand Jesus at the beginning of his ministry. And he would gently explain them to his audience. And Christ's compassion was exhibited by his patience with his audience. And as I think about uh, this in the context of Northgate, we need to be patient 
to our audience. Next, we're going to see the example of the woman caught in adultery. And again, you'll see that this is uh, John 8, verses 1 through 11. And I think this is the first uh, reading uh, for it. So whoever has that one, come on up and read the passage. It's John 8, 1 through 11. Thank you, Ben. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said to them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the oldest even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Has no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Thank you, Ben. Now, as we think about this exchange that uh, Jesus had uh, with the, the scribes and Pharisees in this case, we have to realize that they have what we now call a hidden agenda. Um, they had a bone to pick with Jesus, and they were trying to play stump the dummy with him. And, you know, nobody wins stump the dummy on Jesus and you know they were you'll see that uh, he continues to uh, to call them to an account uh, but the point here is doing that is not showing compassion again I always think of Art Taylor who said get a listening ear you know if we if we aren't compassionate to those we encounter uh, we're just not going to uh, have the, uh, the fruit that Christ wants us to have. So the next part here, it's actually part four of the woman caught in adultery. Uh, and the thing that I thought was interesting was that uh, he waited to the end to let things play out. And you're going to note Jesus final statement, which is five, uh, where he says, let him who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And none did, and all left. And Jesus asked her, woman, where are they? Again, this was a rhetorical question. They had all lurked off. And he says, has no one condemned you? And, you know, Jesus didn't condemn her. But what he did is he left uh, room for repentance and cautioning her, go and sin no more. Isn't it great that we have a, a loving sail, sailor, uh, um, Savior, who when we fall into sin, he is compassionate with us. And as I thought about that, also, I could see everything, and I was looking forward, and that he was looking forward to the cross. So now, we're going to move on to the feeding of the 5,000. I want to make sure that I'm still in, in uh, sync with my uh, uh, slide deck here. Uh, and... 
One of the first things you see is that Jesus understands his disciples and that they get hungry. And you know, it's really a, a time that he uses as a teachable moment. And as, as I read through this, I watched how Jesus prayed and gave thanks for the food. And the disciples and the crowd were amazed by how far the food went. Now, this was clearly a miracle, and yet he did this in such a way that he led them to understand, again, that he is the bread of life. And, you know, I, I really liked it when he had the people picking up all the uh, leftovers. I would love to have seen the look on their faces when they picked up a whole bunch of leftovers, you know. Uh, Jesus was and is the bread of life. The next act of compassion that I see from our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we find in Luke uh, chapter 8 and 42. And the woman had hoped that she would obtain healing without drawing attention to herself. And when she realized that Jesus knew, she fell down before him and publicly testified why she had touched him. And she declared him that she had been healed. This woman had really wanted to be healed for a long time. And Jesus did it. And you can see his compassion in, uh, in treating her so well and so lovingly. And again, as we go out and, uh, and share the gospel, uh, we need to do the same. And I'm always reminded of Art Taylor. Uh, who taught us, get a listening ear. And that's exactly what Jesus did. So next, the disciples are on the road to Emmaus. I think I may have skipped people uh, that we're going to read. Uh, the reading here is Luke 24, 13 to 35. Thanks, Caleb. Luke 24, 13 through 35. That very day, two of them were going to a village uh, named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he was going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, 
for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what, um, sorry. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Isn't that amazing? The way he talked, and the way he uh, encouraged his disciples, it's just awesome. And yet, we need to be encouraging like that as well. We have visitors coming in here all the time, and we need to be open and friendly and listening so that we can show them the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, because he is indeed a compassionate uh, savior. This next one is compassion towards Jerusalem. This is gonna be Luke 13, 34 to 35. Luke 13, 34 to 35. Paul. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them which are set unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wing, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, and verily I say unto you, ye shall not see me until the time come when ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Thank you, Paul. And again, isn't it great that at our worst, Jesus is still compassionate to us? Wow, we do have a wonderful Savior. Next, we have the man born blind who was in John 9, and we're reading 1 to 9. Okay, thanks, Doug. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not this man, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be dis displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. He was the man that Jesus healed. And can you imagine how the crowds who had seen that would then respond? and understand the compassion that Jesus had on this uh, man. Only the words of Christ can open our eyes. Our next one is Lazarus of Bethany, and that's gonna be John chapter 11, one through 44. This is a long one, but it's, it's a good one. Thanks, Randy. All right. <clears throat> John 11, starting in 1. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, 
whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. And then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you are going there again? And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said after that, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. And then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. And then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. <clears throat> and then Thomas, who was called the twin, said to the fellow disciples, Let us all also go, that we, may, that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. And now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. And then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of, the God, Son of God, who is come into the world. And when she said this, these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. And now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. And then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then, when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? And then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot, with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Thank you, Randy. Think about that for a, a bit. Uh, Jesus purposely hurt Mary and Martha to begin with, and yet at the end of the 
of the passage, you see his compassion because he raised Lazarus from the dead. And that grief turned to joy in there, all because of his uh, compassion towards the, this, this woman. And yet still he needed to, uh, he, he needed to uh, show his ability to raise Lazarus from the dead. This is a good time to start to make a summary of how to think or to think how we can be compassionate to others. You know, we're not alone in this world, and we need to pass on Christ's compassion to all that we meet. It's too easy to be impatient and miss the opportunity. I'm always reminded of Art Taylor, who taught us, get a listening ear. He was always watching for an opportunity to share Christ with someone who did not know him. And again, he was very loving with these people. It was a, a, a great example for me to consider as, as well. So we're coming uh, down uh, to the end and just in case, I, I, you know, getting all the, the readers in, if I missed you on any one of them, I, don't, I, I wanna make sure I didn't leave anybody out, you know, come on up and do your thing. I think every, okay, I thought I missed one. <laughs> Save the best for last here. <laughs> Thanks. No problem. In this case, the first is last. Um, this was Mark 4. Uh, verse 1 through 20, it's the parable of the sower. And again, he began to teach by the sea, and a great multitude was gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. Then he taught them many things by parables and said to them in his teaching, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and it happened as he sowed, that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on the stony ground, where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground, and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased and produced some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said to them, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. But when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. And he said to them, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, all things come in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on the stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterwards, when tribulation or persecution arises, for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in to choke the word and it comes unfruitful. But these are the ones sown on good ground, those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. And here, this is actually, I think, uh, better this way because when we when we think about this with the parable of the sower, uh, 
we see that uh, when we sow it with people who just don't want to hear and walk off and the like, you know, it is what it is. I mean, you, we can continue to try and reach out and the like, but the real key is to focus on those who will listen, who will hear the call of the Holy Spirit uh, to bring them into repentance and faith. And again here, the whole idea is to be compassionate, that each of us be compassionate uh, uh, in every such encounter, because there's always somebody whose heart will be opened, and the Lord will make use of us in that. Heavenly Father, we thank you that our Lord Jesus Christ is compassionate, that he loves us. Indeed, he loved us so much, he laid, he laid down his life on the cross so that we might serve him. Father, please help us to, uh, to remember that in our daily uh, encounters with people, uh, that we can uh, share the gospel it's the only real good news in this world. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day today. Thank you for the opportunity to think about Christ's compassion, because he indeed is a wonderful Savior. It's in his name we pray. Amen.